Welcome to the first uh, of our keynote talks for the 2001 uh, conference of the Humanities Educators of North Carolina. We have a lighter attendance than we had um, anticipated by the number who had registered, and I think that there are all kinds of factors uh, behind that. We're so glad that you all could be here, um, and we're so glad uh, that we have the speaker we do. I'll let others introduce her. Um, Following the talk, we'll have about 10 minutes of questions and answers, no more than that. I'll moderate that. And after that, I'll just let you anticipate a lovely reception through the back, through the double doors, and uh, you're all invited to that. I'll give a reminder invitation once this is over. Thanks very much. <laughs> okay. Uh, good evening. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, been a long day, hasn't it? Uh, I'm Ray Bailey, and I'm the president of uh, Asheville Buncombe Technical Community College and delighted to, to, to be so. And we uh, want to extend to each of you a welcome to our campus. Uh, we're excited about your being here. Uh, David Smith, uh, our department chair for humanities and fine arts, has, uh, uh, has worked diligently uh, to bring you all to our campus uh, this afternoon. It's also a pleasure, and Sharon Marcy will introduce our speaker, but it's always a pleasure to have Wilma Dykeman uh, come and visit uh, AB Tech. Our college uh, continues to grow by, uh, by leaps and bounds, and the reason that we continue to grow is because we have outstanding faculty and outstanding staff. <clears throat> this past year, uh, the General Assembly developed some performance measures, and I've always, with sort of tongue-in-cheek, uh, been going around talking about our college being the number one community college in Western North Carolina or North Carolina or the Southeast or the world or wherever. Who it depends on the audience, of course. Uh, but we had performance measures that were enacted by the General Assembly, and lo and behold, we were one of the four community colleges of 58 that received the superior ratings. And uh, people ask why, and I talk about the quality of our faculty. And uh, they ask why we continue to grow, and I talk about the quality of our faculty, and especially in our college transfer programs. Uh, we have just done such an outstanding job, and those of you who are at the university system and who have had uh, AB Tech uh, students come to your campuses, I think that you have seen firsthand uh, what, uh, what they can do uh, at that level. So we're glad you're here, and we hope that, uh, that you enjoy your time on our campus and you have a great conference this weekend. And I know that, that this week has been a horrible week. Uh, in addition to the, to the horror that we're dealing with and all the emotions that go along with that, uh, we've also had budget problems in this state, as you all are uh, well aware of. And uh, uh, I would like to think that that would end sometime. <clears throat> but uh, as of today, it hasn't. Um, but we will continue to, uh, to work with our legislators to try to remember uh, the importance of uh, quality education in this state. So I'll ask Sharon Marcy to come forward and uh, extend a welcome as well and introduce uh, the speaker. Sharon. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. You know, earlier this week, I, I thought we would not be here at all today. And in fact, our originally scheduled speaker, Leon Botstein, could not come because he couldn't get a flight out of New York to be with us today. I think this conference is certainly apropos in light of all that has happened this week. We've experienced a horrific tragedy of brutal, senseless, evil attack on American civilians, and this has ripped the fabric of our lives irreparably. We all know, both logically and intuitively, that our lives will never be the same again. I think these recent events and the future uncertainties that we face are causing us to examine our fundamental beliefs about freedom and civil liberties 
and human dignity and the sanctity of human life. And I think that as humanists, you have a role in helping our students deal with what has happened. The disciplines that you represent, art, theater, dance, music, literature, philosophy, religion, they all help us to understand the complexities of our human nature. They help us to put our world in context. The humanities help us to express our emotions, to understand our feelings, to live vicariously. The humanities fill our lives with beauty and with thought-provoking ideas. The humanities help us understand the deep tragedies that affect our lives and understand the relationships that bind all of us together and the conflicts that drive us apart. So during this dark period, as we search for meaning and for a way to express what is happening in our world, I hope that we as Americans will continue to look to the humanities to provide us with some of the answers that we seek. The humanities provide cultural and artistic dimensions that give so much meaning to our lives. And I believe the humanities give us hope for the future of mankind. This will be a conference probably that you will never forget. We all remember where we were the day that John F. Kennedy was shot. And likewise, in future years, we will all remember where we were on September the 11th, 2001. And we, you will associate these horrible events of this week with this conference. And I hope that as the weekend progresses and you have an opportunity to, to discuss the role of humanities in education, that you will also think about the role of humanities in helping, to, helping students to understand these life-changing events. You will also remember this conference because of the woman who is going to be your keynote speaker today. Each of us recalls a work of art or a novel or a play that has touched our lives. One of the books that shaped my early development was The Tall Woman by Wilma Dykeman. The heroine of that novel, Lydia McQueen, is a resolute Appalachian mountain woman who fights for education and justice in her poverty-ridden world. She was one of my early feminist heroes. Today, we are delighted to have Wilma Dykeman here to share her insights and experiences with us. Wilma has lived all of her life in the Appalachian Mountains. She was born in Asheville to a family with deep roots here, and she discovered a talent for telling stories at a very early age. She graduated from Biltmore Junior College in Asheville and then received her bachelor's degree in speech from Northwestern University. After settling in eastern Tennessee and western North Carolina, Wilma Dykeman became a renowned writer and historian, with much of her work focused on the local region. In addition to numerous short stories and articles that were published in Harper's and the New York Times Magazine, among other periodicals, Ms. Dykeman has authored more than 16 books, and they're all on display outside on a table if you want to take a look at them. Her many honors include a Guggenheim Fellowship and the 1985 North Carolina Award for Literature. She has held the honorary title of Tennessee State Historian since 1981, and she also has taught at the University of Tennessee. I want to read to you a brief selection from The Tall Woman that is apropos to this conference and to the context of this week's tragic events. In this scene, Lydia McQueen has just finished cleaning her spring, which is the source of her family's drinking water, and Dr. Hornsby has arrived to tell her the bad news that a local adversary named Nelson is going to oppose her getting a school for Thickety Creek. Lydia surprises the doctor by laughing at him, and here's what happens next. The doctor looked at her. Nelson is a powerful man, he said. The power of a rock, she replied. But there's something stronger than rock. You see that little ledge over my spring? I've seen it cracked by the stem of a little vine that had to come up to sunlight through it. 
There's nothing strong enough to stop the strength of growing things, and children are stouter than any vines. Wilma Dykeman, thank you for writing these words and for reminding us to be resolute, to stand tall, and to choose hope over despair. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming one of America's great women of letters to Asheville, North Carolina. What a gracious introduction, but it's something to live up to, isn't it? But I was, uh, I guess a writer is always so pleased to know a reader really read closely enough to quote a passage from the book, and that's one of my favorite scenes uh, by her spring, because springs are a, a special experience in my life. But today, um, as she suggested, uh, comes at a, such a critical moment in our lives and in our country. And as I thought about coming here, I, I just wasn't sure that I, that I should really come to you, come at all. And I wanted to assure you that I don't come as any kind of an authority on anything. I don't, I don't know for sure that I can say anything that's profound to you. And, and I learned a long time ago not to try to be more than you were because right after I was married, I just finished Northwestern, as she had said, and I had a contract to go to New York. And I came back to Asheville for the summer and uh, came back in June. And in August, I was packing to go to New York. And Thomas Wolfe's sister, Mabel Wolfe, brought James Stokely, a young man from Tennessee who'd been a friend of Wolfe's and had been very kind to Mabel and her mother, out to my house and introduced us. And this was a Sunday afternoon. And she said, uh, you know, I was in my garden. And she said, well, go get dressed and we'll go out to dinner. Well, we went out to dinner. And the next day, James appeared again uh, at my house, and we visited. And the next day, he appeared again at my house, alone these times, and we visited. And we were married in October. Uh, and uh, so this uh, definitely changed my life. But also, along the way, I'd not given that much thought to cooking. My mother was being very practical. I knew how to you know, cook simple things and keep alive. But I hadn't really been at the top of my agenda. And one of the things you have to do is have your husband's family to eat. And of course, I see all you wives uh, smiling now, and you know what a challenge that is. Well, it was especially one with mine, because his family had been in the food business for a while. But you know, you have to just do these things. So undaunted, I got a dinner together and invited them and they were very gracious, said everything was good, the hot things were hot and the cold things were cold. And so I came in and I'd made a wonderful dessert of homemade ice cream and a homemade special sauce. And so uh, I got all of these together and got all my new sherbet dishes out and filled the dishes and didn't have enough for the last sherbet dish what to do. I couldn't scrape enough off of the others uh, to fill another dish. And I couldn't say, well, I don't like ice cream because the rest of my life they'd say, Wilma doesn't like ice cream, you can forget her desserts, you know. So what was I to do? I just simply could not admit that I did not know. So I looked over and there in one of my serving dishes was some cold mashed potatoes. They were white. And I thought, why not? So I got a nice scoop and I filled that last dish with white, cold white mashed potatoes and I slathered it with the sauce. Now I know what you think. You think I gave that to my mother-in-law. <laughs> I did not, I gave it to me. And I sat down and then I noticed that everyone was sort of waiting. Well, of course, I had to take the first bite. Well, I tasted it, the most awful thing I ever tasted in my life. Julia Childs would never have wanted that recipe, I can tell you. But anyway, I went ahead merrily talking, and they went ahead eating, and everyone said, oh, this is delicious, and this is so good, and we want the recipe for your sauce. They were very kind, but then I noticed that they kept sort of looking because, you see, I'd forgotten. Mashed potatoes don't melt. They stood there firm and, uh, and sturdy while everybody else was eating their melting ice cream. I had to eat the whole miserable dish. And that taught me, I should have just said, I don't have any talent or adept at this and I simply haven't made enough. But anyway, I wanted to, you know, be the professional. So today I want to tell you that I'm coming to you, as you know, under very special circumstances. I was aware of your conference only yesterday morning when I got a call about coming today. And um, 
uh, I guess like people, you know, that are on horseback and they're thrown and then the horse comes by and you say yes. And I thought, well, I, this conference is going to be here. The man from um, Bardo is not coming and yes, I'll come. So uh, I hope it won't be mashed potatoes that you get today. <laughs> But there is no subject, of course, that I feel more strongly about than education and uh, the liberal arts and the humanities. So when I got this call, uh, the television, the news was on in the back of my room there. And that's why I said yes, because suddenly all of this uh, had gathered to such a high crescendo and such a thing. And I thought of all the times when we need the humanities, this is it. And I think that this is maybe just special that I would have to think about it, but that I wanted to communicate this to you too. We may be just a few gathered together here, but it doesn't take very many to make a difference, does it, as we now know. And the humanities are at the core of how we can answer the uncivilized, the savage, uh, eruptions that we have seen in the human world today. So I think that this gathering is very special and I gave it some very special thought, I can tell you. I was up till two o'clock last night listening to the interviews with the p different people from around the world with what had happened. And every time they said something that I felt related to the humanities, I would nod and say, yes, I'm, we're gonna be together tomorrow. So that don't think that because it isn't a huge crowd, and it isn't in a big central metropolitan area, this is where things happen, where you are, where I am. And as we know now, individuals do make a difference. So we're engaged in essentially the same effort, I in writing and you in teaching and each of us in speaking and trying to communicate in a way that probably that we don't even realize today how challenged we are. Um, I had some really important and revealing and challenging interviews with various of our river and county leaders at the time that I became interested in uh, writing about the French Broad River. On September 11th, our world was changed forever. We can sow those words and the, gr the group was now never, the reality of its enormity is, is really not say settled in yet, but I still have a sense that what we're here together today about is about our rivers and our mountains and our air and all this world of, of given that is not the world of made. And so um, I noticed um, there uh, yesterday a very small book uh, in uh, one of my bookshelves and something just led me last night to take it off. It's called Country of Exiles. And I had never read this book. I think somebody probably gave it to me. And the author, William Leach, deplores the academic debate that is uninhibited by affection for any tradition of place. And the more he spoke about this in his writing there in his book, the more convinced I became of the urgency of his message, the sense of place that each human being has to have on this planet, I think. One of the things that brings us together today, I'm sure, is this sense of place in both our literature and in our private lives there. He says that uh, any affection for this sense of place undermines so much of the tradition of America and that nothing or is naturally a place at all, but mostly an idea, he says, an idea or a state of mind that these people have that sees it. And that, of course, means that it is not related in any way to the natural world if it's simply an idea and a state of mind. And so as I thought about that then, I particularly thought about the, uh, about the very personal conversation I wanted to have with you. And I've really learned that at our most personal, sometimes we are also most universal. And I wanted to share with you then that my earliest memory of nature came very early in life by the stream where our house uh, sat beside the stream. That world of nature gave me that sense of born. A world of born is not a world of made. 
The first time I heard that sentence, I knew it spoke to me because I had been surrounded by that world of born. The first words I ever spoke were, water coming down. Wouldn't you know that I wasn't satisfied with just one word, I had to do a whole sentence. But at least I guess my parents were happy that I was beginning to talk anyway, but they often told me about, I was holding me there by the stream, and it was water coming down. And I felt that that was such a reflection of really so much of my life there. So that I was part of the world of nature, this world that we cannot replace once we destroy, that we can only inhabit, that we can only enjoy and preserve and use wisely, Gaelics and lady slippers and ferns and all of the things that I love so much. And then I became related in another way to the world of the humanities was uh, when my parents uh, sat to read so often. Um, my mother and my father both would read aloud to each other. Uh, they read um, poetry and um, novels and history. Oh, a lot of history. Both of them liked history so much. And I played along on the rugs, uh, tracing some of the patterns on the Navajo rugs they'd found out west on a trip. But surrounded by nature and human nature in this way, the humanities were an integral part of my life. And I think that perhaps of all the heritage I have, that is the most important heritage. The sense there that the humanity that we learn through nature and the humanity we learn through literature and through the humanities, the study of the humanities, gave me an insight and a joy in life that I would not have had otherwise. I didn't have a computer as a child. I didn't have all of these instant ways of communication. For a while, we didn't even have a telephone. Can you imagine? I don't really go back to the 16th century, but it sort of sometimes seems so. But today, I look at so many of the young people, and they can't tell you what a plant is. They have never really smelled the fresh air. They've never really sat beside a stream, that world of nature that cannot be replaced. And before I even knew what to do with it, uh, I was part of that world there. And so um, I decided that eventually that I would like to um, read, um, that I would like to write a book. And um, my husband and I had made a trip across the country. And we had taken in our little convertible, brown convertible, the Rivers of America books, quite a little box of them at that time, all the way from the Hudson to the Columbia. And these books were wonderful because they were history, but it was history told as story. The main part of the word history is S-T-O-R-Y. And uh, getting to know these places, not just from the historical standpoint, but from the humanities standpoint as well, gave me a special insight and pleasure in the history. And when we came back, my husband said to me one day, he said, well, you've always lived along the upper part of the French Broad, and I've lived along the lower part of the French Broad. Why don't we merge our knowledge and you write a book about the French Broad? Well, I thought that sounded interesting, so I sent a letter to Holt Reinhardt. And I said, uh, well, don't you, wouldn't you like a book about the French Broad? But you see, I didn't know they didn't realize it was a river. Uh, so it caused, I discovered, a great deal of merriment in the office at that time. But there was a secretary who had visited in Asheville. She'd been to Thomas Wolfe's home in the Vanderbilt House, and she said, no, I think that uh, woman is asking about writing a book about a river. So they did me the courtesy of a reply. They said, yes, we would be, uh, not be interested in a, the small, a book about the smaller rivers. We're not going to publish books about the smaller rivers. Well, my river was much larger than some of the ones they'd already published a book about. Well, you can get a rejection. You can either get mad or get sad. And I found that getting sad never helps anything. And so I just got angry. And I thought, well, they just don't know about my river. So I did an outline, and I wrote a chapter. I invested a lot of time and a lot of effort and imagination, and I sent along that chapter and the outline. I got a back or an apply almost immediately, and they said, oh, this sounds so interesting, and we really would be interested in it. We like the chapter you sent, but in the outline, you mentioned pollution for one chapter. And uh, that's kind of a dead subject, and we feel this book's going to be so interesting and so lively, we suggest you just omit that chapter. Well, here again, this is 1955. Now, today, we'd be very aware of that, but 1955, people weren't talking about even very much 
Uh, the few that were were considered, you know, way out. Uh, and uh, we certainly weren't writing very much about pollution at that point. As far as I know, none of the other books, Rivers' books up to that point, had written about pollution. But here was my river, a whole tributary, the Pigeon River, the whole one whole tributary was killed by the pollution that was dumped into it by a paper company. Dead water came out with great chunks as big as that piano of white foam that came all the way down and the odor along with it came down into Tennessee. So I just said, well, if I write this book, I have to have this chapter, but I'll try to make it interesting. I'll call it, Who Killed the French Broad? And maybe they'll think it's a murder mystery. <laughs> well, it was a murder, all right, but it wasn't any mystery. And so they were, uh, immediately they came back and said, oh, if you feel that strongly about it. You see, sometimes you just really have to take a stand about things. If you feel strongly and know what you're talking about. So I did. So uh, this is uh, what you try to teach then. And what you try to write is not only information, but it also has to be, have a, a measure of the only thing I can call is sort of a natural wisdom, a sense that you have a, a wisdom about your place, a wisdom about your subject, a wisdom about your students there. Uh, I heard a wonderful quote recently, what has happened to the wisdom we've lost in all our information? And I've tried to remember that in classes, uh, I've not been teaching much lately, but in classes that I have taught that it's more than information. It's what you do with the information. It's what becomes of the information. You don't just take a test and get A or D on the test. The test comes with what you do with it, and that's where the wisdom comes. And so I think today that in the humanities, that is a part of our challenge. As we teach the humanities in the classes that you teach, you must bring to it and inspire in the students that sense of their own native wisdom, the wisdom that I think each of us have in one sense. Well, that was published in 1955. It has never gone out of print, I'm happy to say. I think many of the Rivers books have gone out of print. I'm not happy to say that, but I just dropped that bit of information in. Um, and. Um, uh, but after this, uh, we had looked so carefully at this region. We hadn't just done research in uh, the archives in Nashville and in Raleigh and our national ar archives. I spent days in our national archives unearthing material about the Civil War in the mountains because nobody had been written about it at that time instead of that. That chapter on the Civil War helped get me a Guggenheim Fellowship because two of my sponsors were Civil War uh, writers and neither one of them had known very much about the Civil War in the mountains. And I'm glad to say I think my chapters have, on that have inspired other historians recently to go and do research. But we went far beyond that. We went up to every, I think, every road almost in the French Broad watershed. Uh, thank goodness my husband also, his name should also be on the book. I wrote it, but he researched it uh, with me and gave me wonderful ideas. And so that was a, a happy, a happy combination. And talking with the people, we learn so much of the history. Again, the informal history that gives you a sense of what people are all about, of what the humanities are all about. We don't just learn geography. We learn what a mountain means to somebody. We learn what a river means to somebody. We don't just study history. We find out that from a woman sitting by our fireplace, does she know anything about the history of the Civil War? Yes, I sure do. Right there by that fireplace, a Union shot a Confederate. I mean, it was put in those terms of the armies there. By that fireplace, the Civil War had taken place there. So that's the sense then uh, that uh, we gathered from doing that book. Well, it was published in 1955, and at that time, our country was, our region certainly, and our country was beginning, but certainly across the South, we were undergoing a horrendous time, a horrendous time of facing up to the past and confronting the present and trying to build the future. And we had found so much knowledge and we hoped a little wisdom in doing our research in the French Broad, so we asked Holt Reinhardt about doing a book about the South in the same way, starting to Charleston and going to Houston and talking along the way with anybody and everybody, scholars and governors and heads of businesses and also those that were out working in a cotton field where we would stop by and those who were working uh, and all kinds of businesses and trades. and we had 
had over 300 interviews for that book. Now that's a lot of listening and a lot of, not as much talking, but a lot of listening and trying to understand a region that you cannot just label it black or white, but that was neither. Of course, there was evil there that was totally black and evil. And there was good there that was totally white and good. But there was also all these shades of gray that are most of our lives. And so we learned so much as human beings from that effort, but we also learned a lot as historians. And we writing that book gave us a sense again of the humanities there. We learned and tried to communicate with the diversity of this southern region here. And out of that book then, uh, I think that we learned that nature and human nature are so influential with each other that in our wisdom, we need to partake of both of those as we wow. teach the humanities and as we try to discover the whole human experience there. When that book was published, uh, we had some really interesting experiences there. There were people who so welcomed the book and others who did not. They felt that we had not come down either on their side or the other, the other side. And uh, so again, this taught us a great deal uh, about communicating with other people. But the point of it, I think, is not to think of it as being courageous or not courageous or being uh, informed or uninformed, but to just think of it as this was your human experience and others can go out and have their human experience and write about that and discover it and perhaps in the discovery, they will change even as my husband and I changed at several points along in writing our book. Of course, I cannot fill the place of the president of Bard College, who was supposed to be here, only his time. But I can tell you that in our travels, research and writing, we discovered how important you humanities educators are to treat creating a sense of social justice. I am sure that you do not have any idea of how much you might have influenced some people. We found people along the way, older people. We'd say, well, where did you get this sense of, of, of humanity? Where did you get this sense of identifying with people who need your help or your understanding on all sides of the issue? And I would say almost seven or eight times out of 10, someone would say, well, this teacher I had. And that again confirmed my feeling that about teachers, that, you know, I know because I've stood before classes uh, ranging from when my children were in school, from the grammar school up through the university, and, you know, they sit there, well, what are you going to tell me today? You know, this kind of prove it to me, this attitude that you sometimes confront. And I don't know why I always seem to confront those people first, but to see that, and then I think, well, we're going to see. We'll just see if we can't communicate here, if we can't have a conversation together. So educating in the humanities is exactly what the word implies, an exercise and an inspiration in being human. And so often I think we just overlook what that means. But part of that challenge today, it seems to me, is our devotion to technology. And I'm sure you have already um, surmised what my attitude about part of that is. But it seems to me that part of our world is becoming so mesmerized and so much of our time and our talent and above all our imagination is being put into this mechanical world by which we can talk with someone on the moon when we can't talk to someone in our own family sitting in our living room. Now we can send messages quickly to each other across the country, but we don't understand anybody, each other as I can discern any better across the country because of that technology than we did. It wasn't a much smarter, it was a much smarter woman than I who asked the question I did a minute ago, where is the wisdom that we have lost in gathering information, in gathering this technology? How will it be used? Is it just going to keep us focused there? Sometimes I look at my old grandson who's just really, I would of course think he's very brilliant and a wizard, but he really is pretty bright and, wizard, and he spends so much time. Of course, I can't, Deal. I can't even turn on the machine, much less know how anything how to operate it. So he knows that his poor grandmother is really back in another century. 
But my point of it is that I don't find in conversation then that he understands much more about certain things and about this world than I do. He has a lot of information. But I want this bright little boy to get some wisdom along the way too. Of course, we need information, but it is a tool and not a goal. And I would suggest to you that there are those today who have made this technology the goal of this country. The goal of this country. Our technology didn't break down uh, on this terrible, this terrible event here. It was our wisdom and it was our humanity that broke down and that has left us struggling today to recapture that humanity that we so cherish. And that's wanted to tell you then one reason that, that I have turned to novels in writing as well as history and biographies and other, other kinds of, out of 18 books, only three have been novels. But I have felt that the novel gives you a certain way to reach into people's lives. After all, what was it that Lincoln asked Harriet Beecher Stowe? He said, this is the little lady that started the Civil War. And to think that all of the garrison and all the great editors in New England and all the people that had been speaking and writing and discussing slavery, and that novel was what galvanized the attention of the public, of that great uncharted, unwashed public out there suddenly began to see what this was like, maybe in exaggerated terms, but that awakened them. At the turn of the century, there was a novel called The Jungle. It was about the meatpacking industry in uh, Chicago and telling about that meatpacking industry in this novel and what happened to the people there, not just to the animals and the cruelty and the brutality, but what happened to the people. They had to shut down part of the meatpacking industry till it could be refurbished, redone. And there was another example. And we know along the way, we know Silent Spring it called our attention to the fact that there were silences that we had not even realized until that wonderful woman called our attention to it. That wasn't a novel, but it was almost a novel in that personal sense that she had of writing about this whole, whole event. I wanted to share with you just one little paragraph from the English novelist E.M. Forrester about this because I would hope that some of you in your humanities studies and all would, would examine the possibilities that are here to call attention to students. They're saying, I, some, frequently I've asked a student, saying, what are you reading there? He said, oh, it's just a, it's just a novel. It's just a story. Well, as I've said, story is the main part of the word history, and it's not just a novel if it means something. So I wanted to read this to you. Um, for human intercourse, as soon as we look at it for its own sake and not as a social adjunct, is seen to be haunted by a specter. We cannot understand each other except in a rough and ready way. We cannot reveal ourselves even when we want to. What we call intimacy is only a makeshift. Perfect knowledge is an illusion. But in the novel, we can know people perfectly. And apart from a general pleasure of reading, we can find here a compensation of the dimness of our lives. In this direction, fiction is truer than history because it goes beyond the evidence. And each of us knows from his own experience that there is something beyond the evidence. And even if the novelist has not got it correctly, well, he has tried. I really like that last little part that was so lacking in arrogance there because we do try. And we do try to understand then what is beyond the evidence. In the courtrooms, writing the French Broad, I became so interested in the courtrooms and visited a lot of the courtrooms around the French Broad country. And I've always been interested in trials. And so often, I would sit there and I'd think, well, this is the evidence, but what is behind this? We need to know more than just the facts and the figures here. And that is what the novel is all about. It's what the three novels I tried to write were about. The one that was already mentioned, The Tall Woman, grew out of the Civil War in the mountains uh, that I'd studied about for the factual part in, in the French Broad. 
a young woman there who binds up her family. Her father's been in the Confederate side, her husband in the Union side. The whole little valley is torn apart. She has to bring them back together and along the way save the natural resources, the spring and uh, the uh, ginseng when her little patch of ginseng that she's been, she's found and been treasuring when it's dug up and all destroyed and sold to the market. She has to go back and try to save the, that part of the natural world too. And out of that came uh, people, uh, again, uh, that novel, and I tell you this because I want to reassure you that, that novels do have life too, and I'm really proud of this, and I want to share it with you because we're all in the humanities together. That novel's just going into its 40th printing. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm really proud, again, it hasn't gone out of print. There's something about it that speaks to uh, a wide, obviously a wide, div uh, more diverse people than just live in the mountains here. Uh, and um, after that book was published, uh, along the way over the years, I'd have people say, well, what happened to her family, to Lydia McQueen's family? I didn't know. I'd just written, I'd just created them. I didn't know where they went. And I got to thinking about it. And the more I thought about it, the more I began to think what they would have done. They each had characters. They each had a special part in Lydia McQueen's life. And because of that, I could sort of see where they would have gone, what they would have done. The one brother that turns out in the family uh, there to be the one that goes out and gets the big job in New York, building the, the new communities there, and comes back then after a moment, uh, after a, uh, an evening there when he's gone out on a great hunt, and, a, and one of the men is killed, and he is accused of this killing. And so that uh, is what brings the family back together. One's been in Charleston, one's been living in New England, and two of them have remained uh, here in the mountains. And so Clay Thurston uh, is a central character, uh, it seems to me often in our civilization and in our country and in our humanities. He's such a likable person. He's a wonderful party giver and party goer, and he's a great storyteller, and he's, uh, you know, uh, he can drink a lot and tell a lot of stories, and he's been drinking too much the, the night that uh, this man is killed. It's a black man that's killed. And uh, the woman who's the uh, main character, who's Lydia McQueen's uh, uh, granddaughter there, uh, is so much like her mother, and uh, she tries to understand this brother and to try to heal him. And so she, she asks him to come, uh, he's staying at her house as he's come, and her, her son is a senator. And she suddenly realizes that she resents this happening because this is gonna come out, this family thing here with a black man being killed by her brother, that this is really, so all of our values are daily tested, I think, very often. But she cannot renounce this brother, so they're there together. There's one, it's just a small scene in the novel, but sometimes you have a small scene in which you try to say large things. And he says, um, it's the final resolution has come down from the court, and he said, well, I want to know, Ivy, Ivy Thurston is his sister's name. He said, I want to know, Ivy, uh, what's happened to all this? He said, when I was growing up here, he said, I used to go out and fish in the river there, and I'd get all these fish and bring back, and now it's all been fished out. I can't go hunting up in the woods anymore. There's nothing there. There's not even any trees there. Uh, what's happened to it? Where did it all go? And she says, it went with you, Clay. It went with your uh, down your throat with a thousand... Uh, drinks of whiskey. It went down, uh, it uh, bought the clothes for all of us. Our father cut the timber here and we lived by it. It went with us, Clay. It went with you and with me. And uh, so it's a, it's a scene you don't, you know, have a sparkler beside it and say, message of book, you know, inside. <laughs> you, don't, you don't try to guide the reader to it. But uh, the, the wise reader will know because I've shown it happening along the way. And Ivy has been the one who stayed at the home place, who brings this family back together. And I had a wonderful moment there in creating this scene. Uh, I want to share this again with you as humanities teachers to show you how a writer kind of try, knows what she or he wants to do sometimes and then how do you do it. And I wanted to show that this sister is so much like uh, Lydia McQueen, this Ivy Thurston, her, uh, her uh, uh, grandmother, her grandmother mother there, that um, she come, they all come back home. And so uh, how is she going to bring them together? They're, they've always had tensions, you know, brothers and sisters, I being an only child have observed this. You know, they have favorites in the family. And so I thought, well, that, I have to show this. Well, 
I thought, how does she bring them together? How do we bring them to people together in the South, especially when we're not sure how they're going to relate to each other? We feed them. It dawned on me one day, I'd been to a family reunion and I thought, we feed them. And so she has them come one evening. They all come after they've all returned from New England and Charleston and New York and then the two, she and her brother who've lived there. So she feeds them by giving, having each one of them the favorite dish they had when they were children. And she has the great uh, loin of pork there for the one who'd always liked and helped butcher and help get the loin of pork. And she has the corn pudding there for another one and the applesauce for the one that used to help dry and the apples. And each one of them, as they come along with the buffet, remembers and they see what she's done. They said, and they begin to remember different afternoons of drying the apples and of being together. And then she has the big coconut cake and boiled custard for dessert. And for a moment there, they've all been sort of edgy with each other. And I conclude that chapter by saying, uh, for a moment there, they were all together, the oldest unit in the world, the family. And that is a, a way in which she has tried. Of course, they split apart. After that, they have their arguments and they have their tensions there. But that's the way the, the writer works, trying to make human stories, but have meaning as well. In, in, the, in the humanities there. And after that then, um, I did want to write a novel about a big company that begins in the uh, south on the great fertile acres of the river bottom lands. If you grew up along any part of the river, you know what it means when they say, well, that was river bottom land, you know. Of course, I love the mountain land too, where you can't grow anything but, um, you know, Gaelic, or, which is fine with me. But the river bottom land and this big cannery uh, begins there. And I wanted to show what happened to America from the turn of the century until today, as this cannery grew from a small family enterprise that really, uh, cherished the earth and made it produce and then began to extend out and out and out till the present generation then who has lost touch with the roots as the company moved up to a big Midwestern city and has become an entirely uh, different experience except for one of the uh, uh, one of the grandson, one of the sons who still lives there, who doesn't live there but still visits, comes back to visit and comes back to visit in this case and this I think you'll find interesting. I had him come back because his cousin, who's president of the company, and who has driven this com company not so much off the earth as just in becoming a bigger and bigger cannery, a bigger and bigger business enterprise, and he says, you have to go back down uh, tomorrow, down to uh, uh, our old home county there. And what has happened is there's been a spray used on some of the tomatoes to hold them at their peak of ripeness. Because one of this occurred to me because I knew that that was one of the things that was most costly in harvesting tomatoes to can. You have to can them immediately. You know how tomatoes go down. Any of you who've ever grown a tomato or eaten a bad tomato know how quickly they go down. So this was a great breakthrough and a man had come to their company and offered them this. I had devised this idea before we got into this biotechnology, before we'd gotten into this business of what was happening to our food. That was 10 years ago that I wrote that. And I, you know, sometimes I, I have a son who sends me all these clippings from the New York Times and sends me books about this. And he said, you know, how did you know about this? Or what, did you, what do you think about this? And I thought, well, sometimes I think writers and people interested in the humanities have a certain sense about things that maybe even the scientists have to catch up with later. And so the crucial part of this whole book then, it goes back and forth in time. It starts with him coming back down to the mountains, to this uh, farm. But the next one then goes back to his ancestors, to the grandfather who lived there and was killed on one of the great livestock drives as he went over to South Carolina. And then how these five brothers come together, all of them with a special talent, and through hard work and love of the land and this sense of working together that no one would be better or more paid more than the other one, they create this company. And the result of the company is 
that these two grandsons there, the two, not the grandsons, the two sons that are there, that are now representing sort of in a sense the opposite viewpoints. The one who's the president, Stahl Claiborne, could care less about the brothers or the family or even the people that um, uh, he is supposed to be serving and working for in the business because it's all selfishness. Single selfishness and compulsive greed and that, again, is a quote that I heard not long ago, and I thought, well, I was writing about that a long time ago. Single selfishness and compulsive greed will be our downfall. And, and as he comes back then to the mountains, every other chapter brings yesterday up till today, and there is a final confrontation. I'm not sure that it was a good title for the book because it sounds like a, a kind of a wishy-washy title. I had another title and sometime I want to bring it out under that title. Don't ask me what it was because I might use it sometime before you use it. Uh, but anyway, uh, Return the Innocent Earth. And that was the sense, the innocence, the, the openness. N not innocence from being like the sense of stupidity or being just, but the sense of the innocence of the earth, the innocence of people when they're first born, uh, the innocence of people who are sometimes we call the great seers or the great spirits or the great prophets of the world are often the ones that seem so innocent. And sometimes I think our sophistication will be in. So indeed, um, September the 11th did indeed change our world forever. And it has sometimes been changed in the past. When the Europeans first landed here on the shores of North America, and when the atom was split, and when Hiroshima was bombed. But it's the humanities that have brought us through all of these. And I suggest to you that it is not being egotistical on my part or trying to be complimentary for you on your part. When I suggest to you that in the early 1960s, my family and husband and mother and son believed in intergenerational travel, and I want to share with you an experience that we had, because I learned something there about the uh, anti-humanity and one of the things we face today. This is in a collection of essays that I had. We want to go to Dachau. Even as we uttered those words, we realized their falseness, overheard their absurdity. We did not want to go to Dachau. We had to go there. This was in the 1960s. At this village in Bavaria, to be more exact, in a concentration camp located in the vicinity of this village, people had failed, humanity had failed the test of civilization in the 20th century. It was only one of some 30 major such hells which had come into being, flourished and collapsed. But of the 30, this was the oldest, and it had served as a proving ground for many of the other abominations. We were of that civilization, that century, and we had need to know about its failure. By seeing the place, we hoped to divine some secret, absorb some insight, penetrate some darkness of man's soul, which had been revealed here. During the time of the prison, the ditch surrounding this place was full of water. And the barbed wire of the fence was charged with electricity along the top, and at night the wall surrounding the hole was flooded with light. And at any time a guard in one of the towers saw a prisoner step under the grass strip eight meters in front of the ditch, he shot without warning. There was no way of escape from Dachau. Inside the compound and inside its museum, one of the things that first struck a visitor is the fact that everything was in black or white. Gleaming white watchtowers capped with pointed peaks. Long white frame buildings under black roofs. Black words printed large on white paper. Photographs blown up in black and white. No gray areas here, no philosophic subtleties. Hunter and hunted, life and death, good and evil. Enlargements of newspapers, handbills, posters, chronicles of June, January the 30th, 1933, seizure of power by the Nazis. Less than two months later, on March 22nd, the first German concentration camp was set up on the grounds of an old ammunition factory at Dachau. It took just two months 
So obviously the planning had gone on for a long time for this evil place. Two months after that in May, books by undesirable authors were publicly burned. And under that fantastic picture of a mountain of books being burned, which three or three of us remembered seeing in younger years, that picture recording the bonfire of books and Nazism hope, the destruction of ideas, were those prophetic words put there by the, line, by the lines of poet Heinrich Heine, put there by the present owner. Where books are burnt, humans will be burnt in the end. I thought that that was a very important realization there. We older ones remained troubled. We stood beside the heavy wooden block like a butcher's meat stand and looked at the worn surface at the idle leather whip lying across it. How many helpless people had been stretched here, feet and arms bound and dangling while an SS officer wielded his lash, its leather soaked in water on bare backs and buttocks until flesh was shredded and kidneys were ruptured. None of the Nazi horrors bypassed Dachau. As early as the spring of 1933, a city official of Munich protested the outright murder of four inmates, one by whipping, another by strangulation. Efficiency rather than compassion had dictated that these would not account for the majority of deaths, however. Collecting human skin for decorative uses, a hobby at several camps, became so popular at Dachau that it was hard to fulfill the demand for lampshades. As a labor camp, as an extermination camp, it was eminent. But it has been suggested that medical experiments conducted here surpass those at any other place in the Reich. For unremitting cruelty and utter callousness of conscience, anyone would have to look far to surpass the so-called medical tests there. The data of Dachau is recorded in the most proficient way. Reproductions of some of the reports and neat and accurate ledgers of death and photographs. We stopped and looked at some of those. We saw the totals of certain figures. We saw the contorted face of a young man whose lungs were bursting for want of oxygen in an experiment, but we could not comprehend what we saw. And we saw so much more. That night, after we had driven back to our hotel, none of us, my mother, my husband, my two very young sons and I, could sleep very well. We heard them pacing in their rooms, and James and I were in our room, and he brought out a little poorly printed pamphlet that he had found there. They had a little store at Dachau. And this was written by one of the Dutch prisoners that was finally released from this horror. And he had written in this very poor and shabby little article, he had written about his experiences. But the thing that really seized us and never has left my memory or my conscience after that we wondered how all this could happen. And nearby was this great palace we'd been to with our Nymphenburg Palace, uh, with all the opulence and grace and beauty of the past. Of How could we possibly have seen this? And we found the answer to why we'd gone to Dachau in a second personal reminiscence which we read late that night when some of us could not go to sleep. The Dutch Jewish prisoner who had survived to tell his story ask himself why he wrote about Dachau. Why did he want to share this misery? Why did he want to relive it in words? And he answered, the message of the former inmates of the concentration camp Dachau can be condensed into three words, practice more humanity. That reminder offered us a means of atonement wherever we might go whatever we might undertake. So I suggest to you today that when you're teaching the humanities and discussing the humanities, you are doing not just local work and not just work for a special group. You're doing the work of civilization. And we saw it unraveled on September 11th, just it was, it was unraveled all those generations ago at Dachau.
Thank you so much for many words of wisdom. 